Hi everyone, my name is Anthony Cummins and welcome to this video. We're going to talk about Stephen Turnbull and his latest uh, radio interview on uh, Radio Leeds. So at the moment, if you don't know, Stephen Turnbull's got a new book out this year called A Ninja Unmasking the Myth. And then he also has another one out that came out just before it, which is Samurai in 100 Objects. It was very nice, I met him in Japan and he gave me a copy of this, it was excellent, and he sent me a copy of this, which is perfect. So what I'm going to do now is put, well first of all I'm going to say the links are below, so go get both books, absolutely well worth it. Uh, there will also be another video coming on this book alone. So what I'll do is I'll leave you here with his interview, and let me know what you think in the comments below. Really looking forward to introducing my next guest. It's a rarity, it has to be said, that we talk about ninjas and samurais on this programme, but we are certainly going to do it this morning. Let me introduce you to Stephen Turnbull, who's come to see us. Stephen's a leading authority on samurai culture, an expert on the ninja. He's been used on computer games. He was a historical expert on the film 47 Ronin that starred Keanu Reeves. He's travelled all over Japan and has been there around 30 times, we think, Stephen. Is that right? 30 Just times? about. That's Just it. I about. Lost count. Yeah. And he's putting together now a Alistair Cook style Letters from Japan for his next project to share his memoirs. Welcome to the programme, Stephen Turnbull. How are you, Stephen? Nice to see you, Johnny. Welcome. Lovely to have you here. Uh, so you have had a long connection with Leeds University, an even longer connection with Japan. In, in a brief summary, where did it all start for you then? Well, it started um, as a young lad, I was interested in military history. And then I, I developed an interest in Japan. And the strange thing was, I was very lucky I was in the right place at the right time. Because in the 1960s, yes, I'm that old. <laughs> you don't you don't look it. You're very kind. People weren't interested in Japan. There was still negative thought, genuinely negative feelings from the Second World War. So I suppose I was the a new generation to look at it with new eyes. And then I got the chance to go to Japan in 1970, which was very unusual in those days. And my interest in the Japanese side of military history blossomed. Uh, and here I am now, 48 years later, still writing about it and, and talking about it to people like you. You uh, took your first degree at Cambridge. You've got two MAs from Leeds University, a PhD from Leeds University. You've had work published for the Japan Literary Award. Um, you've lectured and researched at SOAS as well, School of Oriental and African Studies. So you are incredibly well read and researched in this topic. There is so much we could talk about, but I want to focus on ninjas and samurais in particular. So ninjas, we might be used to seeing them in old films or, or films that depict the old Japan. What were they? And in fact, were they a thing? Is it widely accepted that they did exist now then? Right, I can explain that quite easily. Ninja, the whole idea of a ninja is of someone who's a spy or goes into an enemy camp to cause havoc. Now, there isn't a military society in world history that hasn't used spies. It would be very surprising if Japan didn't. The strange thing is that until really the era of James Bond, Japan seems to be the only country that's ever made ninja out to be something brave and noble, rather than something underhand that you don't talk about. So the notion of the ninja being an invention, and obviously the, the image of the man in black who can fly in the air, humans don't fly in the air, is based on something very genuine, and in fact is based on an invention that started 400 years ago. Wow. So the quick answer is, yes, they are an invention, but an incredibly old invention that even predates the notion of Bushido and the noble samurai. It's right there, right at the beginning of the 17th century, this exaggerated idea of the undercover agent. It's brilliant. So would they have, as we see in films, uh, which may star Jet Li or the old Bruce Lee things, would they have had nunchucks, swords and throwing stars? Right, let's deal with the throwing stars. That's <laughs> fascinating because when I started my, my new book that's just been published, I thought one thing I'm going to do is completely disprove this notion of the throwing stars as an invention. And the, invent, the discovery I made is that they were actually real. Really? But on a very, very small scale. There was one particular school of martial arts uh, that used them in their practice because martial arts during the, the, the peaceful time of, of Japan were a gentlemanly pursuit, like hunting. 
And the strange thing is that one of the earliest enthusiasts for the exaggerated ninja, a man who lived in the 1930s, called Fujita, took this idea of the spinning star and, and if you like, introduced it to the ninja's armoury. Right. And it's a classic example of this, this notion of the invention of the ninja. The thing we're talking about really did exist, but it's how it was then used as part of the, the ninja myth. Mm. So, yeah, um, they existed. Uh, the ninja's sword, well, you have descriptions of those going back centuries about how you could use the sword to climb up a wall so as I say it, it, it's amazing apart from flying through the air how little has been invented in the 20th century it was all there it's just how it was used uh, and they would have I, I think it was first uh, depicted in literature was it something back in the 1600s by a Portuguese writer who wrote about how ninjas were used to get into castles at the time. Right, the what, you, what you're thinking of, yes, it, this is one of the, uh, again, one of the most remarkable discoveries I made in the research for the book, and that is the, the word shinobi, which is the native Japanese reading of the word ninja, which is, that's the Chinese version of it that we tend to use nowadays, is, is so genuine, it actually appears in a Japanese to Portuguese dictionary. Right published in Japan in the year 1603. So, in other words, a missionary priest knew the word. It was, it was in, in, in common use, hence the bit about to say that the, it's an invention, but such an old one. Based on truth. Yes. Uh, you mentioned samurai Bushido culture. If you go to the Royal Armies, as I'm sure you have, there's some incredible uh, samurai works in there. The, the most amazing armoury that samurais used to wear. How, I mean, as, as I understand it, samurai culture is, is something which has evolved but still has a place in the modern era of Japan, in the way in which people live their lives, this notion of respect and decency. Is that a truth that harks back to samurai culture? Bushido is, uh, to some extent, almost as great an invention as the ninja. Really? In the times of war, you fought and you had a code of honour, a chivalric code, if you like. But it was never written down, it was never formally codified, really until the time of peace in the late 19th century, when it was, I suppose, put together as a way of providing a moral example for the Japanese people when Japan was modernising. And yes, you can still see facets of it about. I mean, traditionally, it was said, particularly in the 1960s, that you showed the same loyalty to your company that the old samurai showed to their lord, and the company looked after you for life. That's not quite so, so true nowadays in Japan. But certainly it's something in which the Japanese take an immense pride, a very genuine one too. So how much truth around there is the... the the, the way of the samurai, the life of these noble warriors with these amazingly ornate armours and their incredible uh, use of the sword. Well, the amazingly ornate armours, most of them weren't made for fighting in. They, they were for show, for, if you were on parade, or, 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 or literally to put it on show in, in your castle. The sort of samurai armour, and there are some very good examples in the Royal Armouries that were made for fighting in a real battle dresses, beautifully designed, with, with reflecting surfaces and, and, and bit, not bits that you could catch on. It turn up with, um, well, for example, the famous face masks, mm. which you'll see, with, with the whiskers and everything. I always think that meant that your enemy would either be frightened to death or die of laughter, <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> You've written, as, as I mentioned earlier, 77 books on Japanese culture. Well, not all on Japan, but, but on, uh, on, yes, m most of them. On history yeah. and many around Japanese culture. What is it about the country and its culture that's so captivating and beguiling to you? It, it, I really don't know. I suppose it's a question of almost falling in love with the place when I was young and then having the opportunity at quite an early age to, to get in, into print. I mean, my first book about samurai was published when I was 29. And, that, you know, and then I've never looked back. It's like they say that your second million is easier to make than the first. The first book was a lot of work. But since then, I mean, I had an invitation just, just yesterday by email to contribute to um, a, a new book, a, a little bit about Japan. They're still asking. I'm 70 and they're still asking me. <laughs> I'm so lucky. And your new project, 
subject then is letters from Japan. Well, this is something I'm floating. For any sort of local radio station that may possibly be interested, my wonderful collection of anecdotes, collected over 48 years of travelling in Japan, China. Uh, I've even been to North Korea. I've got some good stories. So uh, let, let, let's see how that one goes. It, 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 uh, it, it's things I've shared with friends and family over the years. And what is your fondest memory of, of being in Japan? Well, I'll tell you one. I'll share my fondest memory of being in Korea because it's a lovely way to end. And there's my first trip to Korea and I was very hungry. And of course, I can't read the Korean script. And I thought, how do I find a restaurant and read the menu? And how do I find a decent restaurant? And I remember my mother had said about choosing somewhere with clean tables and chairs. So that's a good criterion. And I found one and I sat down and I asked for the menu and I discovered I was in a furniture shop. <laughs> And I say none of my Japanese trips have ever have ever come up to that standard. But uh, I, 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 I've just had so many, so many, so much fun. I've, remind me to go shopping to IKEA with you one day to see how you behave there. It's been lovely to talk to you. It really has. And, and thank you, John. I yes. can highly recommend people get on your website, which is stephenturnbull dot com. And loads of stuff on there. Ninja the Unofficial Manual is coming out in spring 2019 uh, and I would definitely support you in your new project of publishing some of those letters because I bet they're absolutely fantastic. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks ever so much for being here.